Hi, everyone. Welcome to the SVG new sponsor spotlight, joined by Tim Day, SVP of Broadcast Transformation at Quest. Uh, Tim, it's great to see you. Um, that's a fancy title, like that one, Broadcast Transformation. That's a big remit. Um, but for those who aren't familiar with Quest, tell us what your company is all about, kind of the founding and how it kind of came to be established here in the U.S., because I know there's office, obviously a big European presence as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so so that's a, a, a great question. Um, in terms of our history, we started off as a company called On-Prem Solution Partners, uh, primarily focused out of the U.S. in Los Angeles, working with the Hollywood and uh, feature film uh, area. And over time, we expanded into the East Coast, uh, opening up uh, clients in the broadcast space as well. Now, when we look at our traditional service offerings that we were providing there was what I would call more of the back-end technology supporting content workflows uh, for the Hollywood space and broadcasters. So for example, helping them moving into streaming, um, helping with rights management or what we call digital media supply chain um, and really stitching together all the workflows. Um, Over the last couple of years, we've merged with Quest um, who was primarily focused out of Europe um, and they've been around for about 20 years Uh, as a a global systems integrator for the broadcast space. And we're now complementing our services with theirs. So now not only are we doing things like five-year road mapping and strategy, solution selection, software implementation, but we're also doing facility build-outs and broadcast uh, transformation projects to help our clients move from um, more traditional broadcast mechanisms to multi-channel pop-ups, for example, or supporting uh, IP transformation and the like. Gotcha. Okay, so I'll ask you the uh, the easy question because it doesn't sound like you're selling, you're not selling widgets and gadgets, right? Mm-hmm. So sort of consulting and broadcast transformation that is an amazing um, remit right now in the current state of things, right? As far as going to the, do we go to the cloud? Do we do OC, OTT, DCT, um, mm-hmm. or DTC? What, what's your take as far as you know how if if I'm trying to figure out whether I should get involved with you guys? What sort of what what are most of your customers? They're saying we have a problem and we need you guys to help us solve this and give us some good consultancy or sort of how does that conversation begin? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but one one of the great things and the reason I've been doing consulting for twenty plus years now is that our job is to help clients with what keeps them up at night, right? So that could be figuring out what the next strategy would be associated to their business paradigm. Or it could be, what is the next technological evolution that I need to support? So, for example, if we look at the the more traditional media space, there's been a heavy push to go into direct-to-consumer and streaming, right? And then from there, it's, well, what is our business model to support that? Is it uh, advertised support? Is it subscription and the like? And once they've got that strategy together, then they need all the help on how to retool and plumb all the infrastructure and the workflows and the operational aspects to getting that done. So... We help clients, like I said, in every element of that. So whether it's, hey, I just need a strategy for the next several years and how I'm going to get there. Um, and I'm going to get my internal engineering team or I'm going to get a third party to do the work. Or it could be, hey, we really like what you do and we'd like to continue along in that stra- in that journey. So our clients come to us at all different uh, uh, parts in their journey. Sometimes they have a project that's gone off the rails and they really need help just fixing it. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. So we'll parachute in some SMEs. Uh, and really help them uh, solution it out and get it over the finish line. Right. Well, what I like about your company is obviously having a global perspective. Global perspective is very helpful when it comes to these sort of transformational projects, right? Because sometimes Europe's ahead in one thing, we'll, we could be ahead in another. Obviously, Asia can be ahead and behind in certain areas. Do you find that's an advantage as far as just your knowledge base and and the, and the resources internally that you can rely on to kind of get um, some advice and some. Some yeah, no, no, that, that that's a hundred percent. I mean, if I look at back, you know, back in this in the sports industry, going back many years when I used to be totally dedicated to that space, distribution of content to cellular phones, for example, was way more advanced in Europe than it was in the US, right? So right. different regions have different um, capacities or different capabilities that they've been investing in. So having a global presence and a global knowledge of these trends is super important. Um, And in addition to that, we've been finding that our clients are actually really enjoying the fact that they can have teams uh, uh, staffed by us that are spread out across the globe. So it's not about just parachuting people into different parts of the world to solve a problem because we actually have some local presence in those areas as well. So I have one project going on at the moment, for example, that has, I think, four different countries involved uh, with different staff members uh, in it and really helping the client create a global solution for them. 
Mm-hmm. So, so what do you find is the, um, cause I know you want to give me a secret sauce out there, but um, you know, w- when you, when you start t- having conversations with clients, is it better for them to have already had a series of internal discussions already? Or do you think it's better to kind of walk in a little more of a green greenfields sort of situation where you, you're not kind of already trying to battle against opinions or um you know, proposals, if you will. Yeah. So, so I think what, one of the main things that we do, especially in the strategy phase is help to create alignment and make sure that key stakeholders, whether it's at the exec level or the operational level, have a voice at the table. Right. And so from that perspective, it doesn't necessarily matter how far along they've gone in their planning to engage us. Um, you know, a lot of times they will already start doing that strategy for themselves and then say, right, we need an, an execution partner right? The challenge with that can sometimes be they may not have thought of some of the things that they're going to that they're going to hit as they go along. And so as they start executing, they realize like, wow, we have a gap over here that maybe we should have addressed in the in the initial upfront planning. So again, I, I'm, I'm a strong proponent of doing upfront strategy to make sure that your technical design and that your requirements and that your user base is all uh, catered for and that you have happy customers, whether that be internal or actually your customer base, you know, in the consumer world. Um, so again, it doesn't really matter to us because we have the experience in all different levels of this execution. Um, but I would say it's, it's it's better to bring in people up front, even as a sort of fly on the wall, just to help guide you, right? It doesn't necessarily need to be a big strategy to get something done. It's more, hey, here's what I here's what I learned in this in this area. You might want to stay away from that and give me a little bit of advice to make sure that the wheels don't fall off the train. Sure, sure. So you mentioned you've been kind of in the biz for 20 years. I've got about 20 years. Work, I used to work at Broadcasting Cable Magazine covering like the web back in 2000. So I've mm-hmm. kind of been tracking this whole digital evolution, you know, old media versus new media. Mm-hmm. Obviously, you hear all the situation with the RSNs and cable carriage and direct to consumer, you know, MSG here in the city is trying to create a service for 30 bucks a month. Mm-hmm. Um, so what do you what have you seen over the last 20 years? And because I know people you know, they can kind of always feel like fits and starts and kind of like, oh my God, the sky's falling in. But, you know, everybody kind of keeps getting through these, all these difficult times. So what's your sense looking on the horizon as far as th- maybe two or three things that people should be, you know, paying attention to and maybe more comfortable with than they may think they would be? So for example, just experimenting, if you will, with a DTC and... Yeah, I mean, I, I would say, let me answer it a slightly different way. I think that business agility is super important. Right. So gone are the days where everything's hardwired and, you know, you have a facility that's that's, you know, coax cable bound and everybody's, you know, running the same approach. And suddenly you have a new business requirement and you have to build a whole nother facility just to support that requirement. Right. So flexibility is, is super important. And then being able to do what we call fast fail, which is try something. And if it fails, it's OK change it and move on to the next thing. But making sure that your core infrastructure and your core technology and operations element is not necessarily impacted by that. So being able to spin up a team to try to do a pop-up channel, for example, to see if there's a market segment there for you to go after, right, should be a capability of your core infrastructure. And so that way, as things shift, because maybe the next thing that's coming out is, you know, 3D virtual reality, you know, sports events, well, you wouldn't necessarily want to have to build a whole new infrastructure to support that. It should be an adjunct to what you do today. Right, right. So fast fail is fascinating because that's sort of a concept that if you're of a certain age, it's you can't kind of handle the grasp of that, right? Mm-hmm. So, and if you're under a certain age, you can kind of grasp it. So, how do you kind of get comfortable with the fast fail philosophy? If you're if you're older, let's say, and you and you're used to this sort of like we have to be buttoned up, do this mm-hmm. thing the right way, the first way. And, you know, what was me if it goes bad? How do you get comfortable in failing, I guess? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I don't think anybody wants to fail, right? But we learn we learn the most from when we do. Um, and so I, I would look at it and say, well, if we look at the way projects are structured now, um, a lo- there's a lot more focus on agility, right? And using quote-unquote agile methods. So the ability to incrementally enhance a project or a solution or whatever it may be is really important because that allows you to do those incremental steps, test and validate whether it's successful, and then move on to the next one, as opposed to waiting three years to get something done and then suddenly realize, wow, the market just shifted underneath me and I've got a solution that just doesn't work, right? So the ability ability to be agile de-risks that failure concept. 
right? And so, again, we don't necessarily know what the market is going to do in 6, 12, 24 months. But what we can do is make sure that we're agile and that we do things in a flexible nature that's not hardwired. Sure, sure. And I guess the good news about looking to the future, the one thing we can definitely agree on for the next 16, 24 months is that there will always be more sports content being created. That seems to be, it's, <laughs> it's not going backwards. That is for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the first, uh, gosh, the first six or seven years of my life was spent working for IMG, um, who was a sports management company, and they had a television production arm. And you know, I don't know if there's more sports now or less sports now, or it's just more readily available. But one of our primary focuses when this was back in, you know, early 2000s was to de-democratize content, right? So have the ability for the owner to be able to create their own channels or their own distribution mechanisms. And back in the day, that was the dot-com scenario, right? And then from there, it's okay, well, how do we create these different channels or these different streaming services or mobile services and the like? So... I don't know that there's more sports being played today so much as there's more ubiquitous access to it. And so even if you're a local coach at a sporting event or you have a sports club, you can set up a camera now and start to stream online and create a mini presence, right? right? With for a thousand dollars, you can have that up and running. Yeah. I mean, the democratization of content creation has definitely helped. That's, that's, I mean, you know, we look at the college sports market when we started SVG 17 years ago, there was the college sports TV network, right? CSTV. Mm-hmm. Yes, CSTV. I worked and with them. People yeah. were still wondering what's going to, ha- who's going to want to watch all this stuff, and now it's just ridiculous. So I mean, yes. it's just everything. Just get it out there, like you said. One camera, go for it. Maybe three or four, but it's amazing to see. Yeah, and, and that, that that's one of the things that we've been working quite a lot on, and uh, we've been investing a lot in rights management. So we have a fairly large rights management practice that's helping. Um, sports organizations and broadcasters and the like to figure out what content they have rights to, right? And that begins to be super important because especially in the sports space, the contracts are so inherently complex about what channel or what language you can distribute or where and what your blackout dates are and the like. Um, And so having that ability is really important. But what I find is interesting is that that's not really achieved, that's not really beneficial until you have a solid media supply chain that is sitting behind that. So that rights management solution, for example, should be able to help determine what content goes where, when, and why, as opposed to, oops, I just got fined because I did something that I shouldn't, or, hey, I can no longer get that contract from the soccer organization that I may have wanted to. Right, right, excellent. Well, Tim, really appreciate your time. Obviously, it's always great to bring in some new thought leadership into our sponsor well because you know we love having the kind of conversations that we're just having here to kind of help people understand ott and and direct to consumer and the future of rsns and the future of uh global rights you know which is another big thing the way that fact that you know there's more global distribution of the smallest events than ever so really great to have you on board i appreciate your time today and have a great weekend yeah it's a pleasure ken thanks for having us cheers